Oh, good morning. <clears throat> and hey, welcome. Uh, we, we got uh, uh, most of the gang here already, and we'll have a number of people joining us, both live and for the recording. So we're going to go ahead and get rolling. Let me introduce uh, first Bob Dunn, uh, who is our national director. We, uh, we keep changing your title, Bob, but you're basically in charge of everything behind the scenes and um, um, charge of member experience and, uh, and screening out all of those people who want to be part of the organization who... Uh, may or may not be a good fit for us. So yes, welcome, sir. Bob. And you've been, uh, Thanks, you've been working with and helping martial arts <laughs> schools now. Uh, what is it, 16 years? It's it's not plus. Yeah, if not plus some. It's been a long time. It's a long time. Since he was 10. <laughs> I mean, yeah, since I was 10 years old. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually did start really young. <laughs> but that's well, good. Luckily, that's good. You, found him in, you found him in the retirement home. There you go. And then we have, um, um, I, to in, in, anyway, to my left, I, uh, to, I guess to my right on the screen, I don't know. I never can figure out gallery view. Um, uh, uh, Jeff Smith, who is a uh, 10th degree black belt, former world light heavyweight kickboxing champion. But uh, more importantly, you've been running martial arts schools commercially for, God, what is it now? Is it 50 years? I mean, it's a, uh, it's a long ass time. I, I, uh, I hate to say even 60. Uh, well, I, I guess I can't count Texas as, uh, as commercial. I, I wouldn't count that as professionally. No, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you, uh, but I was getting paid and I was, uh, controlling all of the income from the, from the place. So I did learn some of my business training there. Yeah, that's kind of like me claiming I had a, my own school at 14. It, it, it was, but, you know, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you were doing in Texas, what I was doing in Tulsa looks like about 50% uh, uh, of martial arts schools right now. So it's <laughs> yeah. in, in that context. But uh, uh, and then we have um, um, uh, Dr. Greg Moody. Um, you're you're now what an, an, an eighth degree Chief. black belt. You, you just got promoted again. Uh, yeah. Chief Master. Uh, with ATA and a legitimate rocket scientist, you're you're our official uh, counselor and rocket scientist. And uh, I, I must say, you know, the level of empathy on this meeting, you know, you uh, you, you, uh, you you more or less uh, uh, double the other three of us put together. Um, I think uh, Jeff Smith is at the highest level of sadism, given his martial arts background. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, Bob may be at the lowest level of empathy at this point. I'm not sure. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you know be, between us, we've, um, uh, other than Bob, who's been in the, in the support and helping role, uh, we've all run big multiple school operations. Uh, Master Smith, you uh, started with uh, uh, Grandmaster, Great Grandmaster June Ree. Uh, who passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, you were um, uh, running the Junior Institute for all intents and purposes, head instructor, then general manager and vice president, one thing or another, as well as developing the safety equipment company. And that was, that was what, uh, 13 schools at Max, if I remember correctly, in the D.C. metro area? Well, there was 12, but, you know, that, that factory was equal, equal amount of work to all 12 schools. Put together, yeah. Um, and, Greg, you... Uh, you were at one time running eight across uh, Arizona and California, so uh, cross border and, and and doing all of that stuff. And then I had I had grown to uh, six that I owned outright in the Denver metro area. I maxed out about 50, uh, 52 employees. Decided I didn't want any more employees. And then um, uh, Matt Smith, you and I put that, that together as a franchise and ended up, you know, going internationally and um, um, ultimately. Uh, decided that we preferred mostly being on the uh, coaching and consulting side, and hence uh, uh, the four of us have uh, been working together here. But let's talk about what's really going on in the martial arts school business. And, and you know, this is not new. Um, um, you know, COVID really revealed a lot of flaws in people's thinking, but but it's not new. I, uh, um, um, Greg, Bob, uh, you guys know that I have uh, not too charitably been referring to most of the coaches and consultants in the in the industry for at least 10 or 15 years as the bozo explosion and it it um, uh, the COVID experience really seemed to uh, point out how incompetent uh, most of the people running around claiming to be experts were um, is that um, um, 
Master Moody, is that a good way to uh, to say that? Well, it's good and it's accurate. Yeah. Yeah, it's bad and it's accurate. How, how's yeah. how's that? <laughs> it's a good way to say it. Yeah. It's a bad state of affairs and it, because yeah. it's accurate. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. did beat out a lot of those schools. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a way of uh, of really eliminating the weak and keeping the strong going. Yeah, well, well, uh, you know, a friend of mine who's been coaching for years. I mean, his his best uh, 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 advice was, "Now is a good time to retire." Um, and then, um, uh, as we know, a couple of the coaches and consultants were forcibly retired from the the industry. But we had schools that uh, well, we had um, a school owner with three schools that was up thirty percent in two thousand twenty. Uh, we have. Um, um, Tim Harrison, who we met with on our last webinar, he was up, uh, you know, 2020 over 2019, and then 2021 over 2020, and went from 45,000 to uh, over 100,000 uh, revenue a month over the two years of COVID. I mean, that's a, uh, um, and that's not an outlier. I mean, um, uh, how many uh, guys? How many schools would you say? Um, I can think of 20 off the top of my head that in 2020 were up, not down, uh, among our uh, among our team. And, and the heavy hitters around the industry, I mean, people who are uh, uh, friends of ours, but not clients of ours, you know, were happy to only be down 50%. I was, I was shocked uh, by, by the way they thought about that as composed to the way or contrasted with the way we think about that. And Bob, you still hear that. You, you talk to people who are still afraid of the next shutdowns and, oh, my God, what's New York going to do? Oh, my God, what's, you know, and, and, and by the way, oh, my God is right. I mean, the politicians have massively mishandled this, but it, you, you, ha you can choose not to play with the negativity and you can choose to make a massive growth. Um, talk, talk about that, Master Media. What, what, what have yeah. you seen? Well, and to be clear on what you're talking about, this is this is the, uh, not them doing better because they got government money, although you know they take advantage of what they can if they can. But for, for the most part, our guys wouldn't be able to qualify for any of that stuff because they're doing well with their business. And then as things kind of flipped around a little bit, it, yeah, it doesn't mean it was easy. They had to deal with managing things the way that the way that the world presented itself because it was a pain in the butt for everybody but sure. they were up and then as things kind of flipped around uh, they've exploded um i think that it's it's been really wonderful and exciting to see how amazing things have gone, kind of gone around and you know it is is whatever challenge and cycle and whatever challenge and cycle happened is you know things would maybe not perform as well delta or omicron or whatever kind of cycle happened our guys were prepared for that because we set them up the right way and they were they were working together to be set up the right way and they learn from each other as they would go forward. Um, and uh, it's pretty sad to see what happened with the rest of the industry that they stick their head in the sand at the beginning and then, you know, a lot of times not recover or, exp you know, maybe make some small modifications just to try to weather the storm and the storm, you know, it, there's still ramifications of what happened sure. going on now. And our guys have been healthy and thriving instead of that. That's always going to be our, our goal is to be healthy and thriving. And, and I think it's in some points of view, there's always shit that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Or my language, there's always shit that happens, whether it's, you know, personal stuff that happens or professional stuff that happens or martial arts school across the street moves in next door or some, <laughs> something happens in the, in the world, or there's a shooting, there was just a big shooting in Sacramento or whatever that happens nearby and how that affects yeah, your you're, business negatively. You don't have to tell me about those things in Denver. Well, right. Columbine. You know, you have the situation you were doing well in schools and then Columbine shooting, shooting yep. happened. So things can happen. It just happened to be this worldwide thing happened. And our guys were healthy enough to, to get through that and thrive. And that's what we need to be able to do to adjust. And that's what we've helped them do. And that's why these results with these positive results. And I think you know, a lot of people go, oh, you guys are just lying about that. Well, we've got, <laughs> we've got example after example that uh, uh, we can, we, you know, when you're on the call with one of our people, uh, you can, you can hear about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and master yeah. Oliver, the thing I think that was the most important is that you, you actually, I mean, it's almost like you had a crystal ball because everybody was thinking, Oh, they're going to shut down for 
a month or two, and then the things will be back to normal. And you said, we said two weeks. <laughs> yeah. And and you said, guys, uh, it's going to be at least a year before anything is anywhere resembling normal. And uh, you know, as it went, it went even a little farther than that. But I think because of that, the thing that you did most most helpful for everybody is that you did a 180 on the marketing. Yeah. The marketing that was working then, and we had tremendous results from a lot of live marketing and stuff that we had that got completely shut down. You flipped it the other way. Everybody engaged in that marketing and business went on as usual. Even when their doors were closed, you showed them how to do the Zoom meetings that we had been doing for years and how to keep their same schedule, how to do the same intro same marketing, same enrollment conference, but do it on Zoom. And once they yeah. did that and realized they could actually sign up new students on Zoom and actually teach them on Zoom, then it kind of, once they saw a few of our schools do it successfully, then everybody bought into it. And then everybody started benefiting from it. Along with renewals, yeah. uh, you know, on top of that. I mean, that was, that was the powerful thing and it was very effective. That's why I guys really succeeded. Yeah, and and you know what what one of the tools that we've used over the years is you know <laughs> neuro linguistic program, aka NLP, cognitive behavioral therapy, etc. <laughs> but all of them say the same thing. Uh, it, it's the great book by Wayne Dyer years ago. You know, uh, rest his soul. He passed away a few years ago. But it, the great book was the title was you'll believe you'll believe it or I'm sorry you'll see it when you believe it, and that's exactly what goes on with this stuff is, is you see what you expect to see. I was having a conversation with a former client, very sharp individual doing, you know, over a million dollars a year. Um, you know, I have to say, I, I, you know, we helped him grow dramatically over the time, but he had been, you know, he had been doing the, I'm talking to everybody in the industry and finding out what's new. And then, he, you know, then I had a, 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 a opportunity to chat with him a little bit. And he said, "Wow, you know, it's it's amazing how everybody's whining, and 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 you're not whining about anything." I said, "Well, well, you know, what are they whining about?" And here's what we go back to: what you said, Master Smith, is during COVID, what we knew is we weren't going to be allowed in elementary schools to do a PE teach for the day, because in many cases they were pretending to do class by doing Zoom at home and you know and remote learning, and they weren't letting people in the in the front door. Well, okay. We did the same thing we did before, but we did it by, by Zoom. The other thing that happened is the July 4th Festival, the Easter Festival, all of the normal uh, big movie blockbuster releases, all that got shut down. Well, there may not have been an alternative to that, but guess what? Is we knew at the time that, one, people started reading their email again. Who knew? You know, I, 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 was, I was ready for email to be dead and for me to never have to think about email again. And it, it, it had a resurrection during... Uh, during COVID, because the kids were, work, you know, working from home, the, you know, uh, uh, parents were working from home. One thing or another, they had to, they had to read their email. Now, the the second thing that happened was, okay, the live events aren't working, but we were already very engaged and very effective on Facebook. Facebook engagement went up 650 percent, even more. Google the same way. Um, Greg, through Rev Marketing and through all of the stuff that we've been doing, all of a sudden Google. Um, uh, engagement, both pay-per-click and search skyrocketed, right? I mean, all of a sudden search went up, you know, Facebook engagement, but go back to this conversation. He is saying, oh yeah, I'm, I've been talking to people and they're all of a sudden, you know, all they were doing was Facebook and Facebook isn't working anymore. It's like, what are you talking about? We're, you know, Facebook's working great. It's not working at the 650% growth that happened during COVID while everybody was sitting at home and while the kids were sitting at home pretending uh, to study. But it's working great. It's just we know you've got to have a Parthenon. And as other things start opening up, you've got to have 10, 15, 20 different things going on. That's the only way you build a solid marketing plan. So it's, it's amazing how people can whine. You know, they, 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 they whine that um, uh, they got shut down. I, I kept saying during the middle of COVID, said, you spend all your time whining about soccer and baseball and all these other activities, and you're whining about they're going to the gym. All that stuff shut down. You're, you're, the field is clear. What the hell do you have to whine about now? It's, it's like, you know, you, you, you have a wide open um, um, area. But 
Hey, Matt Smith, you've been spending a lot of time with our new uh, members. The three or four things that you're seeing that are the catalyst to get them going, what, what, what is it that gets a school, let's say we've had a lot of it, they've gone from fifteen or 20000 a month to thirty-five or forty, then on to eighty. But what's that initial catalyst? What's the thing that adds 100 students, jumps their revenue, the three or four things? What, I, <clears throat> what I've been talking with them about, you know, first of all, the, the, the training videos that we have for them to supplement our live meetings that we have with them uh, has been very helpful because it has so many marketing ideas for them to do. So what I've been getting them to do and commit to is to devise a, a marketing plan every month. And then I said, look, once you go through 12 months of your marketing plans, you'll then have an annual marketing plan for next year. And I said, when you do these marketing uh, uh, plans, make sure you're tracking each marketing idea you're doing. And uh, I think the biggest thing that, and it's what you were preaching all along, was making them do enough stuff that they were getting enough enrollments. You know, if somebody said, oh, I'm, I'm only getting five enrollments, and I say, okay, what have you been doing? And I said, okay, you want 20 enrollments? Let's do four times that. And sometimes they go, well, I don't know what to do. So we, we knew that there's three levels of marketing. So teaching them the internal marketing uh, ideas, the external marketing, the internet marketing, and making sure that what you call your Parthenon of marketing includes all three of those areas. And I said, I told them, go into our grassroots marketing videos, write down everything you see and put it in the category in a column. So you have three columns, internal, external, and internet, and then go back and circle all the things in each of those columns that you know how to do. Now, I said, now you might not even been successful. You might have said, well, birthday parties, those don't work. But circle it and do it and track your numbers. And then based on that, we'll talk about what you did and show you how to make it better. Because every one of those things that we had on those lists, Master Oliver, all were a home run for somebody. And that's because, and I explained this one simple analogy, and everybody seemed to get it. I said, you know, it's like me teaching a new student how to do a sidekick. And then he goes and spars, and he tries to do the sidekick, and his partner blocks it and then smashes him in the head. And then he goes back to me and says, that sidekick doesn't work. And I said, okay, look at this video of Bill Wallace doing the sidekick. And then he goes, oh, wow, I didn't do that. I didn't lead with the back fist first and then nail him in the, in the ribs with it. Uh, in other words, it's not the technique that you're using. It's how you're using it. So it's not the marketing idea. It's how you're doing that marketing idea. And the best way to know the results is to track it. How many leads? How many appointments? How many intros? How many enrollments? And based on that, We'll then talk about how you tried to make it work and find out where the flaw is. And that's how we then fine tune your marketing to make sure that the ones you are using are productive. But if we don't, and Master Oliver, you guys all know this, what is the biggest mistake that school owners do is they don't keep good stats. They don't track what's working and what's not working. So there, it's a guessing game for them. Well, let's see, what should I do this month? Our guys know what works because they have the numbers to back it up. So that's kind of what's been getting them on track. Now, the other side of that is to make sure that as fast as they're coming in the front door, we're getting a lot of leads and in intros and enrollments, that they're not going out the back door. So we're teaching them all of our retention systems to get them down to one, two, at the most, or worst case scenario, 3%, when I guarantee you most schools around the country are happy at 10%, but they don't know how to get their retention better. And that's another thing that we've been helping them with. And there's a lot of systems that go into play to make that work, but that's what grows a school is I have enough people coming in 
and they don't go out the back door so the school fills up faster. You know, I, I, I like them to think of it as a, a bucket and you're putting water in it. Those are the new students. And then every time you lose a student, it's like a hole in the bucket. So you get so many holes in the bucket, you can't put it in fast enough to keep it from all leaking out. So you got to seal those holes. In other words, not let them drop out and then start filling it up. And that's doing more marketing. And that seems to be what they're getting the grasp on. It's not that we're teaching them how to do a teach a better class. You know, we've got so many different styles, you know, Kempo, Taekwondo, Kung Fu, uh, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, every style, traditional. Uh, so it's not the style that, that makes this whole system work. It's the business system, the character development program that we lay over the top of their martial arts because we have million dollar schools in every one of those categories. Yeah, and, and maybe, maybe to, to summarize or um, um, uh, put it in a simple category, it's, it's a combination of what the lifetime value of a student is and how many students you have. And when you look at, at benchmarks, is people ask me all the time, what's the, you know, what's the average for martial arts lessons in the United States? And my response is always, it's the wrong question to ask. You know, the average of the martial arts industry is broke and part-time, right? The meaning the instructors are mostly working a, a second job and they're mostly uh, broke. So it's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, how much value can I build into the program so that I can be at the, at, at the upper limits of the market and people will not only be happy to pay it, but they'll stay with me for, for life or as, as long as I can possibly accomplish. You know, that, that's the first question. So when it comes to lifetime value, it's one, how long do you keep them? And that can be how many months, how many years, you know, through what rank. Number two, what's the level of tuition that they're willing to pay? And those are really the two primary factors in, in lifetime values. What are they willing to pay? How long are they going to stay? And you can argue that compression or painful or something, you know, helps accelerate that a little bit. But mostly that helps accelerate to the extent that it offsets, you know, sloppy student retention. So, and and you, mentioned a, you mentioned a point about retention. Let's explain what that means. Is when I was doing, you know, regional seminars all over the country years ago, I was originally using an example of Harvard. And I'd say, you know, how many... You know, do you guys know how many people who enroll in Harvard end up graduating? And, and was trying to use that as an example of, of student retention. And I noticed their eyes would gloss over, you know, because it's, it's something like 95% at the time of people who started in Harvard four years later are going to have their bachelor's degree. Well, you know, they, they, they couldn't relate to that. So I started saying, how many of you think you have a better graduation rate than the worst public school system in the United States? And at the time, that was the Detroit public schools. So how many of you think that you do a better job in four years graduating uh, somebody to black belt than the Detroit public school system does in graduating for somebody from high school. Who thinks that? Almost everybody's hand would raise. And back then the reality was 50% of students in uh, Detroit public schools that was the worst public school system, at the time they've improved, uh, was the worst public school system in the United States we're graduating from high school. Well, that's the equivalent of if a school's doing uh, 10 enrollments a month, graduating 10 new black belts a month, right? If they're doing um, uh, 200 enrollments a month, they should be graduating to be better than Detroit public schools. They should be graduating at least 100 new black belts a month. Well, you know, none of them are doing that. But our benchmark is how many schools is a percent how many students as a percentage are you dropping out per month? In other words, if I have 300 active students and I drop out three, that'd be 1% a month. If I dropped out six, that'd be 2% a month. And if I have, in order to have 300 active students, if I need to add, uh, let's pick a number, if I needed to add 15 new students every month to stay even, that means I'm losing 5% a month. And what we see is almost everybody we talk to initially are losing somewhere between 7 and 12% a month. And we can get our big successful schools down to 1% or 2% a month dropout rate. That makes a massive difference. It's, it, it's, it's the same as going from 7% a month to 3% a month dropout rate is the same as going from 10 enrollments a month to 20 enrollments a month, except 
that really it's better because you improve the long-term uh, quality of the student. So the first thing is a lifetime value, and the second thing is just, you know, how many uh, new students can you get in the front door, and are, are the number that you're getting in the front door more than you're dropping out or less than you're dropping out, or are they keeping you steady? And most people don't think about it that way. Um, Ask me, would you agree with me that most everybody we talk to on the way in says, my style is great, I'm a great teacher, or everything is great. If I just had five more new students a month, and Bob, you're the one they asked probably, if I just had five more new students a month, everything would be fine. Is that is that kind of the way they all I, think? I had the conversation all, last all the week. I had the conversation last week uh, when we were talking about uh, what their their problem was. You know, their answer was, uh, I just need more students. And I said, well, okay, uh, how many do you have? And they had almost 150. I said, okay, that's, a, that's an okay start. Uh, I said, uh, how many new students are you doing a month? And they said, well, it's not the dropout. I, I'm, I'm, my students love me. Nobody, you know, they all, you know, love me and don't quit. My classes are all full. And uh, I said, okay, well, just how many did you have enroll on the average last month? He says, well, we get about 10 new students a month. And I said, okay, so that means you've lost 100% of your students over the year. Okay. And then he said, well, what do you mean? How did I do that? I said, well, if you had 10 coming in, that was 120 new students. You still have 150. So that means that almost all of them quit. I said, so your dropout is over 10%. But they love you. But they love oh, you. Oh, and they went, well, I didn't really notice it because my classes, I said, well, yeah, they're going to stay full because they keep, once they get a little full and then they come in and go out, they stay the same. They didn't bust at the seams is what you're saying. So what you said was the most important thing for them to understand is it's not how many enrollments you get. It's a combination of what was your net enrollment this month to measure how quick you can grow. In other words, if 10 came in and five went out, then I'm growing at the rate of five. If 20 came in and 15 went out, I'm still growing at five. So well, they've think, got to keep an eye on the net enrollment each month. Well, I think the problem is when we ask about how many students you're losing, they're only paying attention to the ones that say, I'm leaving you, or the ones that say I cancel, or the ones that say, and, and, and that's, not the number the number is what master smith just said is your active count they're they're calculating this wrong and when we ask the question master oliver you asked me and, and, and bob bob's the one that should answer as you said but the, <laughs> but the the we usually hear them say no they love me they they want to stay and the next question is well what's your retention rate or what's your loss rate and they don't have the exact statistic and the quiz for anybody <laughs> listening to this is really unless you know exactly what your loss rate is, it's bad. That's my rule of thumb. Unless you know what your loss rate is, it's bad. Um, it, well, and, and that's, and that's the corporate thumb. rule of thumb. You know, Druck, Peter Drucker's uh, line was, what gets measured gets done. And by contrast, that which does not get measured doesn't get done or, <laughs> or focused on. I mean, that's, that's just, um, um, you know, primary rule number one. Uh, and, and so you're exactly right. <laughs> The other it, element of it that is, was the silent killer too, sir. You know, during that period of time, <clears throat> because they weren't recognizing that number of their dropouts. So when their COVID numbers mean. dropped and yeah. dipped, that's then it really became evident that the school started to diminish. Yeah, well, you well, said well, that really well, Master Oliver. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but Master Oliver, you said that really, really well. I, I wanted to point this out. Like uh, in COVID during like uh, June, July, August, we had a lot of people saying, oh my God, you know, um, we, we, we're, we're having tor terrible dropouts, terrible dropouts, terrible dropouts. And we said, well, really? You know, you're doing Zoom classes, for example, or you're doing what you can. And really you're having terrible dropouts. Tell me about it. And really what was happening is they were dropping out about sometimes 5% or less, maybe 4%. Their dropouts weren't really even that bad. They were a little higher than we wanted, but let's say they were dropping out 5% little better than the industry average. So they're dropping out 5% a month, but they were doing zero marketing. So, so the, the, you know, they had a hundred students the next month, they had 95, the next month they had like 90, the next month they had 85, the next month. they had, So really after three or four months, they were right at where their targets would be. They're right where they should be because they yeah. did zero marketing. Yeah. Well, duh, it wasn't really rocket science. It was 
just the natural flow of events. And yeah, what, you, what, what's going to happen if you cut off all your marketing channels and then just sit there uh, floating in the water? Of course, you're going to have attrition. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It, you it, have it, the it's, negative it's, net enrollment every month. Yeah. You know, you have to have coming in and going out to get a net. And if your net is negative, you're going down. If it's positive, you're going up. Simple math. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and so, but the, but the key in, in uh, going back to the original question, Master Smith, is one, you know, I, I stole the term from Jay Abraham, but, you know, it's, it's how I launched five schools in 18 months, six schools in, in 30 months in Denver, is it's having a bunch of stuff going on, a bunch of different channels feeding. And where we see even some big schools get lazy is they go, oh, wow, Facebook's working well, really well. That's all we'll do. Or Google's working really well. That's all we'll do. And what we know is there's a ton of grassroots things that you can do that are a little bit labor intensive, but they're inexpensive. There's some other stuff that you can do. Community outreach, it's a little bit labor intensive, but they're inexpensive. There's a variety of marketing you can do. Some of them are very, fairly expensive and low labor. Some of them are, are uh, uh, relatively inexpensive. And people gravitate towards the easiest and cheapest rather than having a, a broad brush of, of activity going on, right? So, you know, that's one is knowing what to do and how to do it. And, and um, I think, Matt Smith, you touched on it a minute ago is oftentimes when you ask somebody what they've done in the past, uh, and, and uh, uh, Master Moody, you say this all the time, oftentimes they've missed the one key ingredient or the two key ingredients to make it go from something that's mediocre to something that has huge results. I know, like with all the stuff I've done with elementary schools over the years, going back to, you know, 1983, I almost never hear people uh, talk about in, in what got called school talks, I called it PE Teach for the Day, the one key element that made it work, and that was permission slips. And if you got, you know, name, phone number, um, um, you know, mailing address, email address now, if you got all that information, it worked like a charm. And if you just went in and entertained the kids and then gave them flyers, it, it didn't work very well. Uh, and so almost everything we touch, whether it be birthday parties, uh, buddy days, uh, school events, or whether it's an online activity like Facebook or Google or one thing or another, almost always those things can be plus by five times, 10 times, sometimes even 100 times results just by identifying the key missing ingredient. Um, um, Mass Moody, on, on the online stuff, we know what happens typically is somebody, you know, um, maybe they have a website that doesn't even have a, an opt-in and, a, you know, an offer. But if they have an opt-in and an offer, what will happen is somebody fills out the form, and then the receptionist at the school shows up at 4 o'clock, goes and checks email, and starts calling everybody, presumably, that opted in anywhere from then all the way back to 9 p.m. The, the, or 8 p.m. the night before. And right. they're getting to them, uh, you know, sometimes 15, 18 hours later, sometimes two or three days later. And, you know, what we know, and it's, it's uh, Google data, if you reach out to them while they're looking at the website, is you're going to be so much more effective than if you get to them 12 hours later. By then, you know, they're out of sight, out of mind, and plus they don't answer their phone. And sadly enough, I mean, a lot of the schools that I speak with, they don't even do that, sir. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no follow-up whatsoever. And, I mean, that's the uh, – uh, Well, you know, there's so many missing yeah, points on – Yeah. Yeah, I think it's worse than that. I think that they might check it a certain time, like 4 o'clock. And the ones that come in five, six, seven, eight, they don't check until yeah. the four o'clock the next day. And yeah, once yeah, it's, a day. And, and you know, I think it's harder for some of the guys that are on the on the their listing now. If you've been doing this a long time, like us, the assumption is it's a little bit like phone calls that came in, like an info call that came in that might have left a voicemail back in the early '90s. Well, there's a little different. It's not that these leads are worse; it's a different nature of the way that people operate now while you you've got to respond while they're still engaged on your website otherwise they get distracted it's the nature it's more of the nature of the way things work um you know with with uh, people are distracted then by their social media or by the next thing they're going to look at it's in amazon knows this if you're on amazon and you're looking at a product amazon does everything they can to get you to buy the product now versus right you now. switching to another product 
Otherwise, they try to remarket and target you, which is not our discussion today. But Amazon does everything they can to get you to buy the product now versus leave or do something else. If they know because they know if you don't buy the product now, you're probably not going to buy the product later and they don't have somebody to call you to get you to buy the product. So for martial artists and for people that are doing this type of marketing, any of your online marketing has to be dealt with as immediately as possible. And really, it's not that much work. If you have a super successful online marketing program, if you get four leads a day, that would be 120 a month. That'd yeah. be super successful. Four leads a day ain't that much, ain't that big a deal for you to call back immediately. It's not, it's not a big deal, but yet people depend on these CRM systems and stuff and they abdicate their responsibility for this type of thing. And that's, that's one big thing that needs to get corrected right all, away. All, all, all those are nice supplements, but they don't, they don't solve the problem. And, and the only thing I would argue about what you said, uh, Master Moody is, you know, the first thing that uh, Jeff Smith and June Ree did to me when I was a long haired boy, um, at Georgetown University from a uh, move from Tulsa, Oklahoma is they put me on the switchboard and I was fielding inbound calls and I forget, but it was, you know, like 60, 70 hours a week sitting on the switchboard, fielding inbound calls for, uh, I think at the time, nine or 10, uh, locations. And, and what, tell uh, me what that switchboard looked like, that was the old style with with all oh, yeah. the buttons, I mean, it looked like uh, it, it pretty much looked like the old, uh, you know, old old uh, uh, '50s movies. It was a little bit more advanced than that, but basically, you know, it was a big switchboard, and all the phone lines would would ring to one place, and then you'd have to hit a button and shift it out to uh, whoever's ready to answer the phone. But I learned very quickly, and that's why they did that to me. Is is that inbound call was was the lifeblood, and yeah, yeah, what I what I what I learned with my own schools and with the uh, junior high schools, for kids, usually it was mom calling, not being sexist anyway, but usually it was mom calling, and usually mom was calling between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., and if somebody didn't answer the phone between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., sometimes they were off to the next, you know. The next school in the Yellow Pages are now the next school in Google. Other times, the note to follow up on the martial arts school went to the bottom of the stack and they never got cycled back through, right? Yeah. And, you know, then it was always a play, you know, I mean, we came up with the, the term phone tag. It was always a game of phone tag trying to, get, trying to get hold of people. But at least back then with landlines, people answered their phone. Uh, nowadays, with mobiles, you know, they don't answer an unknown number. You got to get your number into their into their phone. So it's even worse. So, um, that's the only thing I'd quibble about, um, uh, master Moody is voicemail never worked. Uh, it always was a, a, a huge drop off rate, but people's attention span gap has gone from, you know, minutes or hours to seconds, maybe minutes. And then they're off to the next thing and they have forgotten about it altogether. Right. And, and yeah. it, it, there's such easy, such easy solutions. I mean, there's, you know, uh, uh, Google being at the, the tip of your fingers and Apple Maps, Google Maps, et cetera. You know, they can find a lot of alternatives. You don't want to you don't want to uh, uh, cooperate. There's your competitors. But it's really usually they don't get lost to that. They just got lost. To, OK, on to something else. And and then they forget about it for three months, if not forever. So um, um, that would be my argument. And I, and I think you would agree with that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, but going back to that, you know, what are people charging in the industry and why that's such a bad question is we always start with uh, uh, with new new members that, that we're working with. We start with what are they charging for a new enrollment? What's their enrollment intro sales process look like? And then we feed the pipeline with what our members have started calling drinking from a fire hose, you know, more intro traffic than they've ever had in their life. So the reason we start with the sales process is we know that if you go from five enrollments a month and all of a sudden we quadruple the number of intro traffic you have, that everything you thought was in good shape falls apart, right? And so we start with pricing, with the sales process, and then the Parthenon on a market, opening the floodgates for traffic. And then the other thing we focus on immediately is, well, let's go from 10% a month dropout rate to 5%. To you know, two and a half percent to two percent. Let's get that dropout rate down, because otherwise, you know, to me, what most martial artists are is like they're a hamster on the wheel, right? You're constantly running, 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 and you're running to get the next new student. And it's it's by the way, it's cheaper and easier to keep somebody twice as long than it is to go get a new one to begin with, right? 
it's always cheaper and easier to, go, to, to keep somebody. Let's talk a little bit about pricing, and, and uh, uh, we're going to have to wrap up pretty quickly here. I think the main thing about pricing is just you believe, you know, you, you uh, uh, see it when you believe it. Go back to not butchering that phrase a second time. Is so many times what we hear, and this is from almost everybody, is they say, oh, you don't know my students. You don't know my area. You don't know my style. My students would never, right? We hear all of those excuses. And, and you know, I, I, I've joked about, but it's absolutely true. You know, I've heard that excuse with a school owner who was in Malibu uh, or in uh, Newport Beach, California. And I've heard that from a school owner that was in Dodge City, Kansas. And I've heard that excuse from a school owner who was in the financial di district in uh, Manhattan before they got decimated by Bill de Blasio and COVID. Um, and, you know, everywhere in between. And what, what happens is, is it's not to focus on what you think that people will pay. It's how do you create the highest perception of value and create the highest reality of value. And then from a marketing standpoint, what I like to call fishing in the right pond, how do you get the people in the door who are truly interested in their own personal development, their child's personal development? How do you get people in the door who, you know, I mean, if, if I have a prospect that comes in and they say, well, I really can't afford, you know, tuition and bus tokens to get down here. Well, they were never going to be a good prospect to begin with. I, I, I need to have somebody who, you know, is a homeowner, who is financially stable, who is who is seriously interested in their personal development. Now, that doesn't mean they're rich. My favorite market in the Denver metro area tends to be lower middle class Hispanic because they really care about their kids' uh, development and really care about their uh, um, uh, overall well-being and really care about them having the uh, the next level of, of attainment. So it's not like they're you know driving up in a Porsche, uh, one thing or another. But I do want to fish in the right pond. I want to find people who are truly interested in their development. I want to find people who are financially stable and people who have shown the value are going to be able and willing uh, to pay for it. And, you know, I mean, we could we could mention a couple of numbers. And I, I, I warn everybody, the first thing that many of you are going to do is say, oh, you don't know my students. You don't know my area. You don't know my style. None of my people would ever pay. Well, all of that's horseshit. Uh, pardon my language. Um, um, I'm, I'm glad, Greg, for a change. You kicked off the cussing rather than me. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, you, 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 usually it's me, um, uh, so I will take full credit for uh, uh, for the level of profanity, typically. But it, it, it's horseshit. I, I, uh, um, he gets in, in, entertained when I tell the story, so I will. Is my my close friend uh, Ernie Reyes Sr. and uh, Tony Thompson. I was. I was, and this is years ago now, I was sitting in a staff meeting, and they used to have these meetings of all of their staff and their school owners in a, um, a, a breakfast place. Uh, I forget, I forget, uh, you know, the chain, but they, they had a private room in back and all. They what? still do. They still do. They're the there in the breakfast place. There you go. Probably in the exact same place they've been there for 30 years. But, it, it, you know, I, I'm meeting with them in this breakfast place and they have everybody sitting at tables and we're ordering, you know, pancakes and one thing or another. And, but they have the stats up and good for them. They have the stats up and we're looking at everything. And it dawns on me and I, I, I turn to, uh, I think it was Tony. And I say, why is it that you guys are in Silicon Valley? And so you have a school that's like right between Apple's headquarters and HP's headquarters. And if you don't know where Silicon Valley is, think San Francisco, but really Silicon Valley is the area surrounding Stanford University. And it's more or less from Stanford to San Jose and then from Stanford to San Francisco. That's Silicon Valley. It's the highest income area probably in the world short of, you know, some Saudi, you know, getting their check for oil. But it's the highest income area in uh, in North America, and it's um, um, an incredibly um, uh, sharp, intelligent, vibrant, entrepreneurial area. And so I say to him, I say, you know, why is it you're in Silicon Valley and you're charging half of what I'm charging in Denver, Colorado? And he says to me, he says, well, you know, the cost of living is so high here. That's the, all they can afford. Well. You know, I have the deficit of having a, a, 
a bat, you know, honors, honors degree from Georgetown University in international economics. Uh, but it doesn't take that. A middle school economics uh, student can tell you, or a middle school economics teacher can tell you, the reason why real estate is high in Silicon Valley uh, is, is a factor of a couple of things, but mostly it's a factor of people are making a lot of money and they can afford it. Um, and uh, uh, if things are higher in that area, it's because there's too much money chasing too few goods. It's basic supply and demand. And so it was just it was just a ridiculous thing to say, something that I've teased them about ever since. But the reality is, regardless of whether you're in a poor area, you're in a rich area, you're in a metropolitan area. Um, Jeff, uh, my my uh, my other favorite story is uh, uh, Cody Winkler in Mankato, Minnesota, which I still don't know where Mankato is. I've looked it up in the map somewhere. But you know, median Five income minutes, uh, from from uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. How far? 45 minutes. Yeah, 45 minutes, but it's not a suburb. It's like out in the cornfields, right? Um, and, you know, in, in Mankato, Minnesota, and uh, uh, Bob, where is uh, where is Amanda Olson? She's in uh, small uh, Johnson town. Johnson City, Johnson Tennessee. Tennessee. Johnson City, Tennessee. And then in, uh, and where's Jan? She's in uh, Middleburg, Florida. Middleburg, Middleburg, Florida. All of these are not very rich areas. And they're all charging between 250 and uh, and 350 for a new enrollment, and between uh, uh, 500 and 600 for a renewal. And it's it's the contrast between what you think is reality versus what's reality if you build a program of value and you show value. So the you know maybe we'll kind of wrap with with uh, with this. The starting point is get really good at your at your enrollment sales ratios get really good on what your pricing and program structure is and again the bozo explosion in the in the industry is people don't know how to create a good sales process so they they uh, default to the the easiest and the most simple right they have a sheet and here's how much it is month to month and if you want to you know, commit to a little bit <laughs> okay bob you're going to get all three of my dogs going see that there we go there we go we got the we got the uh uh, the the lab and the um, um, uh, the golden retriever all revved up. <laughs> what what kind of breed is yours? We got a picture of 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 it back there. All yours right, is yeah. the one that can actually jump into trees or something like that. Yeah, it? it's German Shepherd, Belgian Malinois. Yeah, Bel Belgian Malinois, whatever. Um, <laughs> German Shepherd, simple. German, I, can I can I can say German Shepherd. I can say Belgian something. Around. Malinois. Okay. <laughs> Malinois. Mastery of foreign language is not one of my skills, sadly. Uh, just German Shepherd. German Shepherd, yes. Um, but where, 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 where was I? But the, uh, uh, the, the, the key elements are fixing that enrollment process, fixing the tuition pricing, opening the floodgates for new traffic, and then fixing the dropout rate. And Matt Smith, that is um, for our new clients. That's enough to take them from fifteen thousand to forty-five or fifty thousand, oftentimes to sixty. And then our next step is take them from sixty thousand a month to one hundred and twenty. And then our mission right now, and we've got. And by the way, the bozo explosion running around tells people that that, that I'm lying, that this is impossible. And we've got I don't know thirty videos on YouTube with people describing their, their, uh, operation and what they've done and so forth. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take our word for it, but we've got a ton of schools now that are grossing more than a million a year, single schools that are on target this year or next to be grossing 2 million a year netting in the, in the, uh, six figures. Or I'm sorry, Nanny in the seven figures, so Nanny over a million years. Nash, Oliver, if I can just say one thing about the pricing, because that seems to be a very delicate area for a lot of new members. And uh, we have new members that, that bump their tuition a little bit, but are afraid to take that big step. And, uh, you know, we tell them, you know, we don't demand or, or make them charge anything. They charge what, uh, you know, what they think they can do. But what happens pretty quick is they start seeing what the other schools are charging and then they'll start raising their prices. And then, then when they get up what our other members are charging, they all 100% all say the same thing. 
they're kicking themselves because maybe it took them a year to get up to the pricing of everybody else. And they look back and say, wow, I just cost myself $200,000. If I would have raised the price when I joined with you guys, I would have made 200 more thousand this year, but it was just stuck in my mind. But that's what has to happen in your own mind. You have to be the one who sells the program. You have to determine your value and we'll try to help you expand that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Bob, uh, a, a couple last points for anybody uh, uh, participating live or watching the replay for them. Yeah, I, I think it's important that it's not just as simple as raising the prices because all of you do help with that front end sales process, right? So having somebody come in, let them try a class and then tell them it's $9,000. Well, you know, that, that's, that's not the way it goes. And what I would really like everybody who does uh, watch this webinar, participates in the webinar, to give us a call. I'd like to set up a time maybe with Master Smith and let's see what your front process, your front end process looks like. Uh, let, us know, let us get to know your school, see how everything's going and see how we can help you. And you can call me at 720-256-0208. And obviously visit martialartswealth.com. Yeah, and there's no obligation or anything for that. Oh, yeah. We're we're happy to help. And if you're a good fit, and you know the schools that we work with tend to be starting out when we work with them are already in the top ten percent of the industry, right. and then we take them to the top one percent and, and and above. Yeah, and we're on track and to so, be two million this year. Yeah, yeah. I I mean we 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 have some really heavy hitters that got there not because they started out as heavy hitters, although you know we we get that too on the way in the door. But that we that we grew them to that point, um, from forty five thousand a month to one hundred twenty thousand a month, from thirty thousand a month to uh, one hundred thirty thousand a month. I mean, and so forth. We could go over and over and over and over. And, over. and I would say a range, probably uh, low teens to to thirty or plus, is kind of where our new new member usually falls in line when they well, join with us. Is their kind of their starting point. Well, I might, I might, I might add to that is the problem with a lot of school owners that are grossing 50, 60 is they think they've arrived. Yeah. And as soon as you think you've arrived, you've hit a plateau and you're starting to die. You know, it's the old uh, Ray Kroc's favorite quote. I'm not never quite sure what the lineage is. I think it was Woodrow Wilson or something. Um, uh, but it's uh, if you're you're either green and growing or you're ripe and rotting. And it's amazing how much ego uh, some relatively successful school owners develop about where they're at and they think they've arrived, but far from arriving is, is one is, uh, and again, I was, you, you know, I, for one of anything else to watch, I was watching this, um, uh, uh, Netflix special on, on, uh, uh, musicians, you know, like the, the biographies and so forth. And, you know, one of the guys who was, you know, a lead in quiet riot when they hit double platinum and he was a lead in, uh, um, uh, White Snake, and he was a lead in uh, uh, for Ozzy Osbourne, et cetera, is he said, you know, it's really hard to get, reach the top and it's way harder to stay there. Is um, uh, But that's absolutely true. I mean, Matt Smith, how, how many have you seen, you know, Matt Smith, how many have you seen? But, you know, the w biggest way to shoot yourself in the foot is decide that you've arrived and that you're as smart as everybody else. Is It's not about whether you're smart or not. It's about always keeping your, your, your finger on the pulse and looking for places where people are doing better than you and looking for voices that are looking at the world differently than you are and and getting that impetus i you know i tell a story of years ago with that efc board of directors is you know for years i was the number one uh organization in that organization uh and or uh, you know then it was years where steve lavalley and i were kind of jockeying back and forth but i never left one of our meetings without being pissed off and Pissed off, meaning that guy is doing better job at retention. You know, my gross is higher, but he's doing a better job at retention. And this one's doing a better job at curriculum structure. And this one hit a new marketing thing that I didn't think about, God damn it. Um, and so I'm going to rip that off. And this guy, right, it was always somebody who in some subset, no matter what the revenue was, was doing something better, right? I could look at Steve and I could go, well, my nets are half a lot better than his, but his floor is dynamic, exciting. I wish I could get my floor to be like that. I could look at Buzz Durkin and say, God, nobody ever drops out. 
And literally, I, I calculated it, he was, he was losing 0.7% a month. So if, over a... Master, over, if I could just, I want to just interject this one point for people. I know we're almost out of time. Tim Harrison, you know, is he's in Juliet, uh, Illinois. Now, that's about 45 minutes outside of Chicago, one of the lowest demographics. You know, last year, he hit a million in his single school. And, and what happens with a lot of our schools, they... They don't, they aren't satisfied. He's, you know, he told me, I, I want to do a hundred thousand. So this year, you know, last month, March, he had a hundred and nine thousand. He's hit almost a hundred thousand every month uh, this year. And he's going to be doing his goal is 1.5 this year. And I know you told him, oh, you would better shoot for the 2 million, but that's what we got to do is keep going higher. You're not satisfied with your, your old movie, you always want to make the next one a little higher. Well, and, and, and again, to leave it in one of my favorite lines of Tony Robbins that I'll, that I'll butcher is, but it's basically that people will move away from pain or towards pleasure. And any time that everything's just kind of okay, that you don't have a lot of emotional content in it, nothing's happening productive. And I have always found for me uh, that I'm, I'm much more motivated and much more effective when I'm pissed off about something. And... You know, it, 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 as soon as you feel like you've arrived, you know, that's neither thrilled and growing, nor is it pissed off for improvement. And if you look at, at, at people who are wildly successful, you know, Steve Jobs was never satisfied. I like the story of him throwing the, uh, uh, one of the prototypes of the iPhone into an uh, 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 aquarium at a restaurant. And he had said, make it smaller. And they said, well, that's as small as we can make. And he threw the iPhone into the aquarium and the bubbles came out. He said, obviously, there's, there's room in there. Look at the bubbles coming out. Make it smaller. It's like, well, you, you've got to be in that mode of being pissed off about something and being thrilled. And the, uh, you used Tim as an example. My favorite was, you know, right in the heart of COVID, right in, in March and April and May, he was pissed off. Because he had he had set the goal to be up 25 percent during those months, and he was only up uh, seven to 10 percent. And we were laughing at him. I go, you realize that all the big hitters in the industry are down 50 percent, and you're pissed off that you're only up 10 percent. He goes, yeah, because I'm supposed to be up 25 percent. I said, well, I like the spirit. Keep the spirit. That's exactly right. However, and 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 by the way, we're going to get that this year with him is let's say he only hits 1.6 million. Well, he's going to be pissed off because I've been prodding him so hard to hit 2 million. Um, and, and that's what I want. I want him not to have a party at the end of the year, but to be pissed off and hit two the next year. And, and, uh, um, and definitely he's going to hit that. Jan's going to hit that. Amanda's going to hit that. Uh, Stephen D. Castillo's going to hit that. Um, uh, who else? Paul Pendergrass. No, Paul Pendergrass. Um, you know, um, um, 20 other people whose names oh, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's yeah. kicking butt. Dean, Dean Romanelli's kicking butt. We've got, we've got just this endless list. And for everybody I missed, I, I apologize, but we are out of time because we have another meeting starting uh, in uh, 32 yeah. seconds. Um, <laughs> Bob, I'll let you go uh, uh, get, get started in the other, and I'll wrap up, and we'll be uh, ready to go. Thank you, yes, sir. Uh, Grandmaster Thank you. Jeff Smith. Thank you, uh, Chief Master uh, Greg Moody. Make sure I get the titles right. It, that, that, that's right, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and um, Can you give us that number one more time to reach Bob. Uh, 720-256-0208. Perfect. Yeah, give Bob a call and we'll be happy to give you a bunch of stuff for free and give you some some ideas on ways to grow your business. Looking forward to talking with you. So reach out to him and we'll just go through a little evaluation to see how your school's doing and see where we can uh, help it grow.